Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to my presentation about mysteries of temp tables and flow data set parameters. Um, I'll be most of the time talking about temp tables, but since the flow data set is just a collection of temp tables with some additional functionality, everything I say about temp tables equally applies to data sets. Um, whether that's how we pass them as parameters, how they behave in memory or on disk and, and all that stuff, that's, that's absolutely the same. Um, yeah, Mike Fechner, I think I've introduced myself more than enough at this conference. I'm gonna skim over this soon. We do have a logo, and I left it in the presentation. I was thinking to take them out for consistency. Um, so, yeah, in this talk, um, I'm gonna yeah, introduce temp tables and broad data sets, um, especially the aspect of passing them around as parameters um, and uh, yeah, which impact that can have on memory consumption and runtime performance. Um, made some performance measurements, at least I myself was quite surprised by the outcome of those. Um, I'll have, yeah, it's not a quick quiz question, a guesstimate question. Um, I would be very surprised if for the first time one gets really, really close to the right answer. Um, so what I can say is the right answer is probably not what your first thought is. Um, but we'll get to that later. Um, then towards the end, I'm going to also make some comparisons or some considerations about comparing temp tables to a local database. Um, good. So, why do I talk about temp tables? Um, I think for most ABL programmers, temp tables are the most commonly used complex data type in the ABL. And if you look at other programming languages, typically you distinguish between simple or primitive data types like a character, an integer, a date, whatsoever, and things which are bigger. And what do we have in the ABL that can get bigger? Well, we have the temp tables, um, mem pointers. Um, we now have objects and classes that can get bigger, but I think because temp tables are part of the language since, well, since when? Version six, seven? Um, they are there so long. Well, work files and work tables, they had their own, uh, they were completely different. One of the significant differences is that temp tables um, are held in memory while well, memory is available and can then be um, yeah, offloaded to disk. Um, and work files and work tables were always in memory. One of them didn't have indexes. One of them was limited to 1,000 records because it was actually more like an array than a, a variable size data structure. And I hope, um, well, they aren't used that much anymore. So and why are temp tables used? Well different use case. I'm pretty sure there are more than these here. Um, well, if we aggregate data for reports, if we if we have a routine that gathers data for a report, like, I don't know, um, revenue per region per month, um, you might not have such a table in the database, but you, that's exactly what you want to show a bar chart on the screen for. So you will have a routine that needs to calculate all those data, and very likely that would be returning a temp table and then then you visualize a temp table in a chart or in a report. Um, caching of this aggregated data, maybe you want to cache data at runtime because it's difficult to, um, to compose this data based on the data in the database. Um, caching of aggregated data might also for more, um, yeah, less for non-functional um, routines like, like security data, if your data in the database is uh, your security data is based on user groups, the user might be a member of multiple groups, then it could be quite expensive to find out whether this user, based on the 10 groups that he's a member of, is allowed to run a certain function or not, so you might use a temp table to cache that. Um, temp tables are quite handy for um, building complex XML or JSON data for export and import. Temp tables are widely used when you're starting using app servers. Um, 
because temp tables could since version 9 be passed between client and app server. Um, and uh, objects only support this since I think 11.4 or 5. We had the serialization of objects. So whenever you had to, whenever you use the app server to read data from a database to a more remote client, you were using temp tables for that purpose or pro data sets. Um, and that brings us then to all these, yeah, programming concepts around business entities, objects that encapsulate all the functionality around a set of database tables, and they very often are built around temp tables and pro data sets. So generally, the use of temp tables grows, and, and when we start modernizing um, applications with our customers, then that also usually leads to more usage of temp tables and pro data sets than in the past. So, pro data sets provide a function. Did I skip one? Yeah, no. Pro data sets provide a, an extension to temp tables. Um, some very nice ones um, with pro data sets, you can define relations between tables. I mean, the progress database is very often accused of not really being a relational database because the database doesn't support for the ABL relations. Temp tables can have relations with each other in pro data sets. Um, there's a declarative read and update process. You declare where data should be read from, which database tables, which queries, and then you just say, well, now go on and populate this data in the temp tables. So it's, you declare it, and then you just need one statement to execute that. Uh, it supports page data reading, so all the things that in a distributed application make a lot of sense. There's a mechanism for tracking changes, so you can read data into a temp table that's part of a pro data set on the app server, send it to an ABL client or a JSON-based client. The client modifies the data and sends it back, and the um, app server process would then know which rows have been modified additional new rows, creations, updates and deletion, and which fields, and that supports also comparing the original data to the modified data for validation, etc. cetera. Um, pro data set supports when you use the declarative read and update motion, um, process, a mapping of field names in the database. So when you have, yeah, old legacy style table and field names, um, that might not make that much sense to expose them to business partners because you would always need documentation to understand what that field means. Uh, pro data sets and temp tables support a mapping that you could have more meaningful names there. And because they're multi-table, they can support more complex XML and JSON import and export. So like I said before, I'm speaking most of the time here about temp tables, but since pro data sets are just a collection of temp tables, all the same applies. So when we deal with temp tables, we have two kinds of temp tables, or two different ways how we, um, how we define or create a temp table. There are static temp tables. They are defined, and the fields that they provide and the indexes that they have at compile time using the define statement. And we can have dynamic temp tables using the create table statement, create temp table statement. Um, the difference is that create temp table statement allows us to be flexible with the schema at runtime. If you ever see code that does a create temp table and then always adds exactly the same three fields using add new field without any logic that makes it dynamically, I would consider that being a bug, a programming mistake. If you know the number of fields and indexes when you write the code, make it a static temp table. That's, for me, there's no point in discussion. Um, dynamic temp tables, if you have configuration that adds the fields at runtime and users might be able to change that, con that's a good use case for a dy dynamic temp table. Um, we see dynamic temp tables also way more often in generic purpose code in frameworks in templates and not in what a developer should be using when he's writing business logic. Um, dynamic temp tables, you can make much, much more mistakes there that are hard to find at development time. 
Um, and since generic code, framework code is usually more better tested because it's used more often than a specific business logic function, I think we should try to avoid using dynamic temp tables as much as we can in, in, in ordinary business logic. Static temp tables are always scoped to a compile time unit, um, compile time unit being a procedure or an instance of a class or a static class. We cannot have uh, a temp table which is scoped to an internal procedure, for instance. That's sometimes a bit naughty when we do recursive processing. We might want to have different different instances of the temp table with each iteration. That's not possible with internal procedure. Um, temp tables are managed by the runtime in a way which is very, very similar to a type 1 storage error database. Uh, records are organized in blocks. There's a buffer pool. The startup parameter for the, that de determines the size of the buffer pool minus capital B, lowercase t. That's like the minus capital B for the database. We have a BT for the temp table buffers. Um, and there are three different block sizes. There's a TMPB size parameter. We can have one, four, or 8K block sizes. There's a maximum value for the number of buffers here, 50,000. Don't ask me why 50,000. So if you use 50,000 blocks of 8K, that means the maximum memory that you can have in an ABL session for temp table buffer pool are 400 megabytes. Quite a lot. Or not a lot. Depends on how you use temp tables. Um, they're kept in the buffer pool until the buffer pool is fully occupied. And then it starts writing to a file, the DBI file. And in some places in the progress documentation or the knowledge base, the DBI file is re referenced to as the temp table database. Sounds a bit weird because we're using temp tables in, as an alternative to the database, but they're very, very similar. And this dumping of data to the DBI file, that can have sometimes very, very strange effects with performance. If you have a program that fills up your complete temp table buffer just barely, that runs super fast. If it goes a little bit over that boundary, then it will start writing, um, oh, it will start taking the, the block in memory that is not used for the most for the longest time and dumps that to the DBI file. That takes time because we're writing to disk. Now, if you need a record from there, it's not in memory. So the same happens when reading records from a database. The runtime will have to make a block in memory available by writing it to disk and then reading this block into that space. That takes super long. And now guess, guess what happens if the next record that you need is the one that you've just written to disk? Your performance drops immediately. That feels like, like you're, you're, you're hitting a wall with 200 kilometers per hour. Because um, suddenly, you, oh, your code runs super fast. You're using temp tables, hooray. We, we, we don't have to use the client server database connection that much. But suddenly, you, you keep on writing to disk, reading from disk all the time. and not that bad with SSDs these days, but with a magnetic disk that was even pain more painful. <coughs> so that temp table startup parameters, I mean, I um, mentioned them before, BT, team PB size. The minus capital T specifies the folder where they're stored. The minus lowercase t parameter makes the temp tables visible. Um, when I wrote this talk, I was really surprised because on Windows, suddenly the te temp table, temp files, the DBI file, wasn't visible. That was a feature I only knew from Unix before, but I still have to figure out in which version of OpenMatch that changed. Um, that might have something to do with um, TDE, the transparent data encryption. I read something in the knowledge base there um, that not making the temp tables visible is something that's required for TDE support. Um, but if you want to make temp tables visible, use the minus capital T. And why do you want to make it visible? That's the easiest way to know how much data you have in this temp table database file. So if you want to understand why your program suddenly gets slow, 
the first thing you should look at is whether your DBI file starts growing. It's like a database, once it's growed, it never shrinks. So you always have like the high watermark um, of usage of data on disk that should have been in memory. So, time tables are organized like database tables in blocks with a maximum, there's a minimum value for minus bt of 10. DBI file grows, never shrinks. According to the documentation, the memory actually used, I said 400 megabytes, it's, it's actually 440, it seems to be 10% over the um, product of BT and team PB size. Um, so how much BT do I need? Well, as much as needed until you don't grow. Um, unfortunately, the only really reliable way to figure out the right value is testing. So, on an app server, especially pass OE, the BT is per session. So if you say, I have a production pass OE with 200 sessions, and you go for 50,000 blocks of 8K, we're speaking of 200 times 440 megabytes. That's quite some memory. Um, so, and on my laptop, I, I checked these combinations of memories of VT 10, 50,000 with an 8K block size. My development pass OE uses two sessions at startup, and the memory of the agent process was 11, uh, 110K versus 992 after startup of an agent. And you can see that in the task manager, the multi session app server process. It hasn't done any work yet. At start, it allocates the temp table buffer. Like the database buffer, it's allocated when you start the database server and not only when it's needed. The database buffer, you can grow that at runtime. You never shrink it. Temp table buffer, there's no method of growing it dynamically. And when you use the OE manager and look into the memory consumption of each of the sessions, then you see that they really allocate half of that memory each. And now we have that with 10, um, uh, minus BT10, the minimum value. And uh, yeah, there are less digits than on the other slide. And you see the agent takes 110 megabytes only. There are other um, parameters that have something to do with temp tables. Minus that as reuse, I hope nobody is on a version where that's relevant anymore. Um, the um, ZDS reuse parameter enabled in version 12.2 the usage of classes that define temp tables of raw data sets in the re reusable objects cache. Reusable objects cache is something that makes OOABL applications significantly faster. Um, in Open Edge 11, you're not able to cache objects there, instances of objects that, are, that have been deleted. You cannot cache them there when they use temp tables or data sets. And in 12.1, Progress has added that feature, but they said, oh, we first need to test it. We need to enable it and disable it. And there's a ZDS reuse startup parameter that turns on that feature starting 12.2. That's the default setting. No check temp table names. Um, is when you're passing a temp table from app server to client. It checks the compatibility of the schema only based on the data types and the order of fields, not on the names of the fields. And the TT Marshall controls how much schema information, including whether labels and help text and all that data, is being exchanged between client and app server with each call where you pass around a temp table. This can also have a performance impact because if you have temp tables with very small amounts of data. The schema can actually be more data that's sent over the wire with every request than the data. So if you have uh, a temp table with just one record, be the most extreme or even an empty one, um, there's a lot of schema information that goes with this temp table over the wire. And using the different options of the TT Marshall, you can set the default whether labels, help text, and all that stuff are being sent. If you don't send labels and help text, with the temp tables over the wire, 
then the client cannot dynamically obtain them from the data set it has re received from the app server. If your client is statically compiled, it probably doesn't need that at all. <coughs> if you're not setting those as using the startup parameter, you can set that using attributes on each temp table. So then there are startup parameters for measuring temp table performance, just like um, the virtual system tables for database access. There are virtual system tables or something like virtual system tables for temp tables. Um, and then you may want to look at the TT base index, TT base table, index range size um, parameters, and table range size parameters to control for how many temp tables the application keeps statistics data. As the statistic data needs memory, so it might be impacting the runtime performance. So let's start with a very simple program. <coughs> and, and all the programs I use here are quite simple. So I define a temp table, TT customer, like a database table. And I specify a single index there. So it's a like definition. I specify an index, so this temp table will only have that one index. It's not going to inherit the indexes from the database schema. If I do not add that index, the temp table will inherit all the five indexes from the databases. The indexes in the customer table, there's the custom index, a name index, one on country and city, another one, and a word index on the comments field. Doesn't matter which fields have the indexes. Um, so, and then I use a simple for each on the database table, create the records, count them. The Sports 2000 database that I use here has 201,000 customer records. So I'm creating a temp table with 201,000 records. That's extreme, probably most temp tables in real world applications are smaller, but I want bigger numbers because they're easier to measure. And then I look at the time it takes for creating these 201,000 records on a temp table. And then I loop through them, sort it now here by the name, which is not indexed anymore because I only have an index on the customer number. So when I run this program with different combinations of BT and TMPB size, then I see that with um, block size one, I end up having a DBI file size of 41 megabytes, and with an 8K block size, only, four, uh, only 34. So it looks like with larger block size, I'm making more efficient use of the blocks because I less frequently see that the record doesn't fit in this block anymore and I need to create a new one. So in bigger boxes, you get more than in the same amount of small ones. So that's the consumption of space, either in memory or on disk. Um, the time for populating the temp table, 2001 records, is with the smallest temp table buffer, 3.3 seconds, and with the biggest one, two seconds. So populating the temp table with a bigger buffer goes faster. One is it's creating it in memory, not on disk. And the second is, well, it also needs to access index blocks. There is an index in this temp table. And doing that in memory is also going to be faster. And then I have the for each. That is the non-indexed for each, because the name field in that case doesn't have an index. So I see that my times they vary between 5.4 and 2.5 seconds. So now, the same with an alternative temp table definition. I leave out the index definition. So now I have all the five indexes. Sales rep was the one that I was missing earlier. Um, custom name, country, postal code, sales rep, and the comments field. 
Same program now, just with five indexes instead of one. So, assumption is that the for each by customer name is faster because that's an indexed field. So, if we take the BT10 and temp block size one, how does the runtime of this program now change with five indexes in the temp table compared to my earlier one with one? So if I go back to the slides, that was running <coughs> 5.4 seconds with just populating a single index, but then iterating it non-indexed. So I think expectation is clear. The population of the temp table becomes slower. More indexes means more work. Querying it then by name gets faster. But in combination, the total time, you will see an increase of 10%, 50%, two times, 10 times more. Anybody, I guess? You said three times or two times? Two times? Two times? So that's my test program with different startup parameters and, 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 and averaging it. Um, 25 seconds for populating the records. And the other program was in total five seconds. So I'll show all the, the data on the next slide, but what this means is if that would have been an app server report running on the app server, we've defined the temp table because we have a lazy programmers like the date with table, adding four extra indexes that are not used, the impact on the performance can be quite big. Temp table indexes are really something that I learned to pay close attention to. So the Top four are with the one index, that's the table that I had earlier, and here now we have the five indexes. It's also expected that the DBI file gets a bit bigger because indexes need to be stored somewhere. And in this sample, if I do it like this, I know there are 10 1K blocks in memory and everything else is in this, so I can safely assume that this is the temp table size was that. And it's easy to measure it that way when I give the temp table very little memory because then I see it on disk in the DBI file. The way I look at the DBI file in this output is actually not by looking at the file on disk. I use the temp table VSTs to, to, to get the data out of C progress runtime. If somebody's interested, that's code I could, could make available. Um, so I see the time for populating is getting much, much more. It's getting really terribly um, with the small buffer. It's still, when I have the temp table completely in memory, it took two seconds and now 3.8 seconds. So even with a fully in memory temp table, creating five indexes versus one makes it two times as slow. So, then we see here the time, no, the time for the for each by name, this being non-indexed, that being indexed now. And we see that is faster, that is expected. However, in the total, if I go through that temp table only once, it has to be sorted by name anyway. Either when I create the records in the index, or when I open that query once on the fly. So I'm going to sort it by name once anyway. So, and now we just need to be very clear on how we're using it. Are we populating the data in a form that the temp table is really only of a very short living nature? And I'm for eaching it only once. That would be the temp table that we create on the app server to get the data to the front end. Then the app server is never going to 
go in all those possible indexes over the temp table, and all those indexes would just be created for nothing? Or is it a temp table that I hold for very long, and it's very, very um, realistic that I really use all those indexes? So like in a database, I mean, we have customers where asking for adding an index to the database is really a fight that takes months and weeks or years to get that one index there that makes three of the reports so much faster. No, because the indexes could impact create performance. Um, you need to have the same debate with yourself, because as a programmer, you don't have to fight with the DBA that much. Um, you have to have the same debate with yourself if you really need every single temp table index. So a like definition, temp table like database, we inherit many database tables that can be critical. And it can become more critical in the future, because if that DBA suddenly creates five additional indexes to the database table for performance there, you suddenly get those five indexes in the temp table as well. And if you're not changing your code, it's pretty sure that you will never use them. So temp table indexes really handle with care. So, and in that example, we've always been faster with one index versus five indexes. There was never a time where we've been faster. I mean, I could have also taken the mess, what if I create exactly the two, the prime unique key one and the name one. Um, but um, usually my observation is developers just create that one for the prime unique key or take all. So that's why I took the times here. So the difference when you have a small temp table buffer is really, really significant. Now you could say, hey, we, have we can create 400 megabytes of temp table buffer ever, ever, but if we go on the pass OE and we have 200 agent sessions in that one pass OE, who really can allocate 200 times 440 megabytes just for temp table cache? I mean, it would be cool if we have that much memory, but that's getting quite a large number of memory. Um, so, with a large temp table buffer, it's still noticeable. Um, yeah. Indexes are slowing down the things if we don't use them. So be careful when, which indexes to define. Only define the PU, uh, primary key index and others if needed. If you're using pro data sets, you will always need a primary key index, otherwise <coughs> using the data sources with a pro data set becomes a bit more um, painful because you the, the data sources get the key fields either from the index definition or you have to specify them in the program. So now let's look at what happens when we pass temp tables as parameters. So temp tables can be passed from one program to another as parameter. The default passing of temp tables as parameters is by value. By value means the temp table is duplicated record by record, field by field, index entry by index entry. It's not taking the blocks and creating a copy of all those blocks in memory. It's record by record. Um, so when you pass them, the schema needs to be similar, um, which can be relaxed using this no check TT names parameter. So but let's also try that out. So I have a temp table definition. This one here, TT customer, like customer with a single index. I run that program, um, and that has an input parameter table for TT customer. So with a single index, passing the 201,000 records as a temp table parameter of populating the temp table takes 3.4 seconds here in this uh, configuration, uh, no, 3.7, passing that as a parameter, 3.2. Why is it a little bit faster? Well, I'm not doing the loop anymore. I'm not reading from database anymore. Um, I'm already from temp table to temp table. And I see from before calling the other program to the other one, the DBI file size is almost exactly doubled. And I think the point 0.1 that's missing is in the digits that I've taken away there. Let's do it as an input-output parameter. 
So input output means I'm passing the temp table from the caller to the called program and getting it back. So 3.6, I mean, there's always the air humidity and air pressure that have some impact on that. Um, so, but now calling that program and returning takes six seconds or 3.2 before. So it's also almost doubled. Um, so input output is passing twice by value, record by record, field by field, index block, index entry by index entry. Um, so, and the, well, DBI file size is not affected here. When you pass temp tables as parameters, you can also notice a consequence with row IDs. Um, very often, row IDs are used just as a very generic way to identifying a record. So if you're within a session and you have a temp table here and you pass it there, and you'll say, now do something with that one record, you might say, okay, I'm passing the temp table and the row ID. That won't work in this way because a raw ID is not some, some record key value. The raw ID is a physical address of the record in the buffer. So it's the record number, uh, the, the block number and the record number in the block. So if we create a copy of the temp table from here to there, it's logical that it's in a different block and a different record number there. And as such, also the raw ID values change. So here when I look for the customer number one, um, and that is the case with the input output. So in the original program, the record was at one location. In the called program, it was in a different location. And when I get back the input output parameter, the record is also having a different position. So you cannot trust temp table raw IDs that much. And that means there should really be a prime unique key in every table and every temp table. It's the only hope for really identifying a record. There's a keyword called by reference that you can add in a run statement or also when you're calling a method of a class. Um, only on the caller, and that is, if you ask me, a design flaw, I would like to be able to say on a called program that I should only be getting a temp table by reference. Because in that temp table, I know what it's doing and which direction it should be going. Anyway, so, and what happens then is I, um, um, I pass from the caller to the called program something like the handle of the temp table. And then the records are not duplicated. The reference is provided there. And the caller's temp table will make the temp table in the called program inaccessible. The called program will then be working on the same instance of the temp table provided by the caller, not on its own. So if you're writing a program that, sh that creates some specific customer records in memory in the, in the main block, and then somebody calls into an internal procedure of you with by reference, the temp table that you have prepared for this case is not accessible anymore. It's hidden. When that call is finished, it's being available again. So it's, it's overloading that. And because of this impact on the called program, I think by reference is something that I would have to define on the called program and not on the caller. Anyway, but it saves the raw ID issue and the runtime for calling the program is now three milliseconds and not three point something seconds. So it solves the performance problem and it solves the memory problem. It, within the called program or the callee, we cannot directly say whether we are working on our own temp table or on one provided from the outside. There's a by reference attribute on the temp table object. 
a timetable widget. Um, and if you're working on somebody else's timetable, the by reference, the, the um, num references attribute returns one or more. Then you know, okay, the template that I'm working is not my private one, it's some one that I'm getting from somebody else. So by using whether num references is greater zero, you can tell whether it's your temp table or a temp table that somebody else has bumped into you. So here for temp table, uh, in the main block, I display the num references and the handle of the temp table. Then I have an internal procedure where it's the same message statement. So when I run that, I see in the main block, I had a handle val value of 1081 and num reference is zero. So there the persistent procedure was still working on its own temp table. But within the internal procedure where it got the by reference parameter, it was working on the temp table handle 1001, so a different handle, and suddenly the number references were one. So that way you can tell that you're working on somebody else's temp table. Um, by reference has some interesting effects on the, whether you specify parameters input, output, or input, output. By reference always is input. The caller always provides a temp table into the called program. If you say output by reference, it's just confusing. I'm still passing my handle in there, whether it says output, input, or input, output. The caller is in control of by reference. The exception is in combination with the table handle parameter. I'm going to talk about the table handle very, very soon. Um, there, when the caller doesn't have an instance of the temp table yet, and table handle it is working with dynamic handles, uh, dynamic temp tables, then it actually gets a temp table from the called program back. And then again, you read the code and you cannot see by the way of the parameter you're passing in which direction it's going. So, and in these situations, sometimes uh, you will see myself on a big whiteboard and I'm having persistent procedure, persistent object, blah, 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 who's working on whose temp table when and for how long and, yeah. Um, so what that means, that's the, this caching sample I meant earlier. So this is a persistent procedure. In the main block, I'm populating the temp table. Here I'm starting the procedure persistently. I'm running the internal procedure. I'm using output table TT customer because I believe that's going to give me the records, but no, because the calling program passes this empty temp table into this internal procedure, and what he gets back is its own empty temp table. Well, it's not getting it back. It was just providing the reference. Um, so that doesn't work with by reference. In this case, you need to get a a copy, or that's what we'll see later, work with the bind keyword. Um, if the called program is designed to always work on a temp table provided by somebody else by reference, you could use the reference only option in the temp table definition. What then happens is this program, the called program, will not create a temp table on its own when you run it but it knows the schema, the compiler knows the schema, the compiler can check if the fields and the data types and all that stuff. If the program then tries to provide, try to use its own temp table this way, it's not possible because this temp table is not going to be initialized. So then comes the bind to the picture Bind is a keyword that has been added later to the language. <coughs> it's similar to by reference. Um, bind needs to be specified on the caller and the called program. So they have probably obviously learned that it's better to have it also on the called program defined. Um, bind provides a permanent coupling. So with bind, two programs permanently, permanently will be working on the same temp table or more than two, can be three, four, whatever number. Um, by reference, it's just valid during that call. So when you return from that call, it's by reference, 
both programs are working on their own timetable again. With BIND, it's permanent. BIND can be specified input or output. Uh, BIND requires the receiving timetable definition to be received only. So with by reference, the uh, reference only is optional definition, can save some memory because also the empty timetable definition requires some memory. BIND only works with reference only timetables. So there's also some validation that it will be defined in the correct way. So how does it look in the, pr in the code? Um, we have here a program with a reference-only definition of the temp table. Here we have a full definition of the temp table. It's the same program as earlier. Here, populate the data and have a bind uh, procedure. This program persistently starts the other one, um, runs bind table, and so from here on, that temp table definition and that temp table definition will always point to the same temp table instance in memory. So if you would be looking at this like, like in an OO fashion, then you'd have one program and another program. And so far, the temp tables have always been like within each program only. But now we say the temp table lives by its own, maybe a little bit closer to this program because that created it, but that one has a reference to it, and they share the same temp table. Bind, bind is a little bit like, like marriage without a divorce. You bind one definition of temp table to another, into an instance, there's no way of divorcing and marrying somebody else. Bind survives the deletion, deletion of the instantiating procedure. So in this case, when that persistent procedure is deleted, the temp table will live not forever, as long as anybody has a reference to it. So there's no need to be worried that, ooh, how do we delete that other temp table? No, no need to do that. One thing that the last 30 minutes might have been clear is that passing temp tables as parameters in a memory efficient way can be a little bit confusing. You never know who's working on whose temp table and for how long. In very complex cases, it might be useful to then use an object as a main container for a temp table definition. Reason for that is objects, it's like, it's like data, and objects are always passed by reference. You never duplicate an object within a single progress session when you're passing it from one procedure to another one. So, and then using objects together with bind um, is then a more clearer way or easier to understand who's working on whom. So you have an object, a class, that would be customer temp table holder, for instance. There you have the temp table definition. You expose one public method to allow somebody else to bind to that temp table. Then one program creates the instance of the table holder, binds to that temp table, and with that it would have access to the data in there, or it can create data there. And then we call a different program, and instead of wondering which is the best way to pass around the temp table, we just pass that object, and that other program then also binds to the temp table within the object. So then we use an object basically like a, like a box around the temp table, and that just makes it clear that when I'm passing around the object, I'm always looking at the same instance of the temp table. <coughs> So in all my samples, um, so far I've had the temp table definition copied all over the place. When you start considering temp tables and being like the like like a data structure that you use in multiple places, or like an object of itself, if you ask me, the definition of those temp tables should be placed in the include file. We don't have anything else in the ABL to share temp table definitions. So we have copy and paste or include files. And in that case, the include file is the lesser evil, if you ask me. And then you should consider to have 
compile time arguments to that include file that allow you to specify the reference only keyword. If you're using classes, the other argument that you'd have here would be whether the template would be private or protected. Templates cannot be public in an object, but private or protected. And, and that's what we generally use for temp tables to make them shareable. So now come table handle parameters. And I know that some developers think table handle parameters are the solution to all temp table performance problems. And that's a very dangerous statement because they're not. Table handle parameters is not a handle way of passing a temp table. A table handle is not a handle of a, of a temp table that you pass around. A table handle parameter is like a table parameter just with a dynamic schema. With a table, par table handle parameter by default, you're also copying a temp table record by record, field by field, index entry by index entry. No difference there. If you want to share reference with table handle parameter, you have to use it in combination with bind or by reference. As simple as that. So table handle parameters do not pass around the handle of a temp table. They're just a schema-less representation of a table parameter. So same rules apply regarding by reference and bind. Ah, I thought that was a five-minute sign. <laughs> So you can combine table handle parameters with by reference, but you have to add the by reference keyword. By default, a table handle is by value. Um, and also there, I would really recommend you to not use table handle extensively in normal business logic. Because in normal business logic, you'd like to know the fields, and you'd like to have compile time validation against data types and all that stuff. Um, I've seen applications where developers started to using OO ABL and many, many small classes to solve a problem that previously they solved with one big procedure. And because they didn't know how to bind and pass temp tables properly, they passed around handles of temp tables and worked with dynamic temp tables all the time. And, and if you ask me, that's counterproductive. In the ABL, we've always had schema validation for database and temp tables. And now, we want to go towards OO to get uh, compile time validation also for properties and methods and all that stuff. And we should not sacrifice the schema validation for that. And it's not needed. I mean, it's, it's, possible, it's perfectly possible to use bind and by reference um, and still be able to share temp tables in an efficient way between different, different objects. So that is... Now an example for a table handle parameter. Um, so we're passing the TT customer from here. This program just counts records. This program is general purpose. It just gets a table handle. It should be capable to run on the customer in the order in the sales rep table. It creates a dynamic query. And it's all dynamic, counts the records and probably would be returning it rather than writing it to the, to the log file. Um, so there's a table handle parameter. But in this case here, because I'm not using by reference, the, the temp table is copied record by record, field by field, index entry by index entry. And we can see that here. Um, we start with 35 megawatts of memory, 105. 140, so I'm creating multiple instances of that. And I see that with each call, each of the five calls, it adds 35 megabytes. That's actually producing a memory leak. Why is it producing a memory leak? So I'm passing the table. This creates a new copy of it, and I'm not deleting it. So when you're passing temp tables, dynamic temp tables, using table handle parameters, we have a risk of memory leaks. So it's not only not efficient and not only easy, not only difficult to read, 
no, it has a risk of memory leaks. And 35 megabytes is probably the biggest memory leak you can produce in the ABL. A query handle that you leave in memory that takes weeks until that becomes 35 megabytes. But here we have set very, very fast. So, so then you need to start looking at memory leaks and temp tables. The lock manager um, comes to help. The client log file when you have the dun objects uh, for database objects, database objects includes temp tables, helps with finding those. And so here I see each time I run the program, it creates a temp table, it creates a query, it deletes the query because that's what I coded in my final block. In the code, I was cleaning up the queries down here an understandable approach. I create the query, I delete the query. I'm not creating the table. Why should I delete it? Well, unfortunately, the AVM is of a different opinion. So we have to do that. There are two solutions to this problem. Well, there's knowledge base about that. I'm trying to speed up a little bit. So when I get to the last point. Um, one is within the called program, you need to delete the temp table. Um, delete object of the temp table that we haven't created. We need to check whether the handle is valid. You try to delete an object on an invalid handle, you get a runtime error, which I find bad because I want this object to be gone anyway. Why do we need to check whether it's valid or not? And is Peter Van Damme here? No, I'm not using no error. I'm never using no error. Um, so that's one way. And then we see we have the temp table only once, so the caller has its temp table and the call program once creates a copy, but we don't have a permanent growth in memory. Or we use the by reference keyword, same as with database tables, and that also solves the memory leak. And here again, we have a case where the called program is dependent on the way the caller passes the temp table with or without the by reference keyword. And that's why I still believe, it hasn't changed in the last five minutes, that the called program should be able to say whether it wants a by reference or not. So since I'm only working on one temp table, I stick to 35 megabytes DBI file size. The need to delete a temp table hurts my eyes each time I see that with an output temp table. So if I have a program that outputs a temp table, we need to delete the temp table too, because otherwise we also create copies. copies. Um, you say, hey, I'm deleting the thing which I'm returning. How could it still be returned? Well, the AVM knows that it's the parameter that's being returned, and it defers the deletion of the temp table until it has been returned to the caller. Um, yeah. Other option is also to use by reference there. So, with that, let's have some thoughts about um, comparing temp tables and the local database. So database tables and temp tables are organized at runtime in a very similar way. In blocks, can be in memory, can be on disk, depending on whether there's memory available. We have similar options for the block size and number of blocks. Read performance of temp tables is not generally faster than a local database connected via shared memory. So if you warm up a database's local uh, minus capital B, warming up means you just run one query going over all the records, using all the indexes that you want, and then all the blocks are in the, in, the, in the minus capital B if it's big enough. The performance of that of accessing that database in shared memory and a temp table is almost the same. Um, and I'm saying almost the same because I cannot say with 
full confident that it's exactly the same and what might have influences, but if you generally measure it, it's very, it's very similar. Um, it benefits from whether the records are in block or has a disadvantage when they're on disk. <coughs> so temporaries are of temporary nature. Databases are persistent in the database system. So now we have an app server. So applications are more and more moving towards the app server. We have a pass OE with 200 sessions in production. Running typically the same code, you'd have all the temp tables that might have some purpose of caching data, blah, 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 200 times in memory. Progress hasn't implemented a way to share the temp tables between app server agents. There was, 15 years ago or so, a discussion about agent shared temp tables and stuff like that, but that never came true. A database, a local database on the app server agent, on, on the machine of the app server, would be used by all the 200 agent sessions. So if the data cached is actually the same, it's pretty obvious that having that in a database with a more temporary nature will be more efficient. And in that case, I don't have the 400 megabyte limit for the memory of that. So instead of 200 times 400 megabyte, I could use once the memory I need, as big as I need it, and use that for certain caching temp tables. So user interface repository objects, the security data, translations where you also may need multiple records reads to see whether you have a certain translation in general Dutch, Dutch for Belgium's, whatever local dialogue of Dutch, or whether you fall back to English, um, and stuff like that. So temp tables has a big benefit of schema management. You don't have to load a DF file and uh, I mean, schema management has been getting easier in, the, in, 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 in Open Edge than before, but yeah. Um, but you have way more options for tuning the performance of that local database. You have APWs, BIWs, private buffers, more minus capital B, type two storage areas, all that stuff. So when it comes to certain caching of data, you should really think whether caching that on demand or when you start the app server, whether that's really the best choice. Um, when the database is on a remote machine, then yes, the temp tables in the app server will be faster than the remote data. Um, but if you're reading data from an application database that's on the same machine and you're not aggregating data, you're not reading many records and storing them as a single record, etc., cetera, then um, a temp table might not improve the performance as much as you believe or hope. <coughs> so what we are working on slowly but surely, some of the caches that we have now framework, like UI repository, authorization data, and the translation data, that are the three obvious ones that I mentioned earlier. Um, we are working on an alternative way of caching them that when we start the app server, we cache it once in a local database that all the app server agents are connected to rather than expecting that each of the app server agents caches the same data that he needs to prepare each of the time. Um, in small app server environments, we're not expecting such a huge gain, it's like only two or five sessions, then okay. Um, but when you're going to production with large numbers of users, I'm, I'm expecting their huge benefit um, by being able to use a much bigger minus B parameter than, than minus BT, et cetera. Um, I mean, it will make the management harder because we have to have a database. It needs to have the right schema and all that things. We suddenly create more schema management tasks. Uh, maybe we need to um, have ARNT scripts that can uh, be executed on the app servers when we start them to create the schema and so on. Um, but it should improve the efficiency. Focus there is the app server, not so much the GUI client, because the GUI client typically is remote from the database. Um, so it may be a better solution 
I'm not speaking against temp tables. There will remain use cases for temp tables. If you're passing data from the app server to the client, you'll have to use temp tables. But for all those caching purposes where the data is cached because of a high degree of aggregation, um, there I think database tables will be beneficial over temp tables used at every app server session. Or in short, pros would sun should should get back to designing agent share temp tables. Questions? <laughs> Good. Well, then we take the questions outside if there are questions. Thanks for your time and have a safe trip home. <laughs>